Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Reactaria. Today, after many, many requests from you guys in the comments, we're back with our old friends John and Jane as they tell us their opinion on the concept of extinction. As I talked about in episode 2 of The Light of Evolution, the concept of extinction was actually a monumental discovery that took several hundred years to fully develop, and which shook the very foundations of our understanding of the world around us. It was fundamental to the development both of the theory of evolution and the practice of modern science as a whole. So I'm sure that John and Jane will have nothing but reasonable, logical, and justifiable things to say about the topic. But before we get into that, I have to thank my patrons on Patreon. They're the ones that keep this dream alive, who make sure that I can afford food and rent and better equipment, and the sponsor of today's video, Babbel. Language is a hallmark of human evolution and a cornerstone of human achievement. It's an incredibly useful tool to broaden your horizons and to open up new opportunities. That's why I'm always happy to learn about new languages, and Babbel is an excellent tool to do that. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the entire world because it teaches you more than just vocab words. Babbel's lessons are designed by real language teachers, and they focus on how to navigate real-world conversations so you can start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. I saved a cat. They even have live classes, and you get two free with your subscription. And the best part is, they're offering my subscribers 60% off their world-class service with a 20-day money-back guarantee. And all you have to do to try it out is use the link in the description below. As for me, I'm studying Spanish, porque más personas hablan español que inglés. Así aprender español me da la oportunidad de hacer más amigos y ayudar a más personas. Listen, different language learning styles and apps work for different people. So if you're trying to learn a new language and you haven't given Babbel a shot yet, now's your chance. Use the link in the description below, get a massive discount off your subscription, and if you don't like it, get your money back within 20 days. It's an awesome deal, and I hope you try it out. Thanks so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video, and now let's see what John and Jane have to say about mass extinctions. Is it just me, or is the explanation for mass extinctions kind of missing the explanation part? No, it's just you. It is always just you, Jane. Hey, John. Hmm. What you doing? He's quickly closing a thousand tabs, Jane. Leave him alone. Okay. Many evolutionists believe there are probably five different massive extinctions in Earth's history. You can see them right here. They date these extinctions by where they believe they see them in the geologic column. So the most famous one is the huge asteroid, right? Yeah, right here it says, evidence shows that at the end of the Cretaceous period, a huge asteroid crashed into Earth. About that same time, dinosaurs and many other species went extinct. What's the weirdest thing that could be a problem with that statement? Let's see. About that time? Uh, well, this theory's had some problems. First, some scientists dated the dinosaur extinction 300,000 years after they say the asteroid hit. A little delayed action there. It does kind of sound like a delayed reaction. Until you go back and read the textbook that you were just reading out of. The asteroid caused global climate change. If that asteroid had been big enough to kill every single dinosaur on the whole planet all at once, there wouldn't be any more life left on this planet after that event. The asteroid hit the Earth, it killed a lot of things around the immediate vicinity of where it landed, and then a lot of other things died over the course of the next few millennia as a result of rapid climate change. It's also important to point out that while early estimates did put the time between the asteroid impact and the end of the mass extinction at around 300,000 years, and that did spark some controversy and some skepticism within the scientific community as to just how important this asteroid impact was, not whether or not it happened, just how big of a role it played in the grand scheme of things, more modern and more accurate measurements put that time frame at about 30,000 years, a whole order of magnitude less, and that is very, very reasonable. So what they're talking about here is not only inaccurate, it's also very much outdated. Another study suggested that the asteroid was too wimpy to cause the mass extinction. I don't know exactly what study they're talking about here, or if such a study even exists, but again, nobody is saying that that asteroid was the sole cause of this mass extinction. It's just a triggering event that set off a cascade of other things that took out the dinosaurs and lots of other species over the course of tens of thousands of years. 
There would have been several other factors, such as increased volcanism, increased cloud cover, rapid changes of climate and sea levels, and even fungal infections, which reptiles normally have to bask in the sun in order to fight off, but they wouldn't have been able to do that for a long time due to the increased cloud cover after the asteroid impact, giving mammals, endotherms, a huge adaptive advantage. That's called the fungal infection mammalian selection hypothesis, and it's one of my favorite things to think about regarding the KT extinction. But again, John and Jane don't have to take this from me, it's right there in the textbook that they're reading from. Guys, you have to read the material if you want to learn this stuff. Another team claims that they found dinosaur fossils that lived past the impact. Yes, we have found lots of dinosaur fossils from after the asteroid impact, for all the reasons that I just talked about. Also, it wasn't all of the dinosaurs that went extinct in this mass extinction, it was just the non-avian ones. The avian dinosaurs, the ones that had already evolved warm blood and feathers, those guys evolved into birds. Literally all the birds on Earth today are the descendants of the dinosaurs that survived the KT extinction event. Which makes dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggets like a really weird thing to think about. So, it's far from settled. No, it's pretty settled. We have mountains of evidence for literally all of this. Is the same thing true for other mass extinctions? Right here it says, Until recently, researchers looked for a single cause for each mass extinction. Then it continues. Many mass extinctions, however, were probably caused by several factors working in combination. Volcanic eruptions, moving continents, and changing sea levels. You mean they only have several different ideas about what caused mass extinctions? John, that's not at all what she just said. Right. But they just listed everything that would be taking place during the worldwide flood. What? Wow, you're right. You know, Genesis 7.23 says, So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Wow. What an evil thing to do. I wonder how many pregnant mothers and newborn babies died in this horrible event. Also, even if it was somehow justifiable to murder every single human on the planet all at once, what did the cattle and all the other animals do to deserve to be drowned in this way? Of what sins were the gophers guilty? More importantly, what kind of absolute monster would do something like that in order to get their point across especially when they have infinite power to do literally anything else. But ignoring the monumental moral problems with this story, Jane said that what we were describing is everything that would happen during a worldwide flood, which raises a lot more questions. Like, for example, why would a flood set off volcanoes? And how could volcanic activity contribute to mass extinctions if the entire Earth was already underwater. Also, how did a flood cause continental drift? And what about the asteroid, which is how we started all this? Wouldn't that thick layer of water have lessened the impact? Why do we find things like swavites and techites and shocked quartz, all things that we know are made by meteor strikes in and around that asteroid crater, if that asteroid just splashed down into water deep enough to cover the entire planet? And why do we find a layer of iridium metal, which is another clear indicator of extraterrestrial impact, at exactly the right spot in the geological column to be associated with this mass extinction event? And why is that iridium layer globally distributed, which is only something that would be possible if this impact was, like, really, really big? Why are you acting so nervous? And why are you sweating so much? And why do you look so hungry? And... You didn't read your science textbook, did you, Jane? This fits perfectly with all the massive fossil graveyards we find all around the world. For example, at the Lance Creek Formation in Wyoming, we found lots of species of dinosaurs mixed with birds, fish, crocodiles, lizards, snakes, turtles, frogs, salamanders, and small mammals. So I just looked it up, and the Lance Creek Formation dates back between 65 and 69 million years ago. All of the animals that you just described were around between 65 and 69 million years ago. 
It's not like the dinosaurs went extinct and then all the turtles and salamanders and mammals all just quickly evolved within the last 65 million years. They've all been around for hundreds of millions of years. Do, do you think that we think that the dinosaurs were the only things alive in the Mesozoic era? You know, I've heard that almost every dinosaur graveyard in the world shows fossils deposited by or in watery mud or sand. That's because fossils form in watery mud and sand, John. That's where permineralization takes place. It's like you just said, I hear that we only find ice cubes in little trays inside freezers. Like, yeah! That's where those are made, dude! And even more incredible, many dinosaur fossils are found in a classic death pose with their necks arced back. Possibly from choking. Lots of dinosaur fossils are found in what's known as an epistatonic position or a death pose, with the head arched back over the body. And this can happen for a variety of reasons, from poisoning, to infection, to lack of oxygen to the brain, which can happen for a variety of reasons, not just drowning. And experiments on modern chickens have shown that it's really easy to knock dead birds into these positions, meaning that a lot of these dinosaurs may have been placed into these poses after death but before fossilization due to totally normal taphonomic processes like being eaten by scavengers. But the most important thing to remember here is that lots of different kinds of animals assume this same pose for lots of different reasons, not just asphyxiation. So here's the million dollar question for you, John. Why do you think so many dead dinosaurs are found in a death pose? Take all the time you need. Exactly. So, if you take their geologic column and squeeze it down into one event, the worldwide flood. That does better explain what we see. No, it absolutely doesn't, and I will prove it to you. If all of these animals died at once, why do we find them in layers with every ecological niche represented in each layer? Why do the animals tend to get more complex as we move upwards across the layers? Why don't we find all of the bottom dwellers and all of the large non-swimming animals all on the bottom and all of the little fish and light floating animals all on top? Wouldn't you expect in an event as big and violent as a global flood that they get mixed up a little bit? Why don't we find a single human fossil down among the dinosaurs, or vice versa? How did all the terrestrial plants survive being under seawater for over a month? How did coral reefs survive being under that deep of water for a month? There are some places on Earth where the geological strata is overturned, and creationists love pointing to those places as proof that the geological record is unreliable. But while we have logical explanations for these places, where are yours? If everything on Earth died all at once in a global flood, why are there some places where everything died in reverse order? How do we have different layers of sedimentary rock at all? Wouldn't they be all mixed up into one homogenized mass if they were all laid down at the same time? How is it that we have different layers of different kinds of rocks that all solidified independently of one another if they were all deposited simultaneously by the same flood? Chalk is pretty much 100% fossils. It's made of the compressed remains of marine microorganisms like plankton and coccolithophores. If there was a global flood, how and why did that compression happen? Wouldn't something so small and light be evenly distributed throughout the entire geological column? Why do the sedimentary rocks in very deep places like the Grand Canyon not contain any fossilized pollen from grasses or flowering plants or any of the other stuff that would have evolved over the last 300 million or so years? There are several places like Clayton Lake, New Mexico, where you can find fossilized mud cracks from the Mesozoic era. Literally dry cracked mud covered underneath millions of years worth of sediment. So how did that mud dry out while it was underwater? If there were only two of each kind of animal on the ark and all living animals come from those two individuals, why is there so much genetic diversity within species? In this video, Answers in Genesis said that all the animals on Earth came pre-equipped by God with all the alleles they would need to show all the diversity we see today, but that wouldn't make any sense if there were only two of every kind of animal. So are they wrong or are you wrong? Where does all the variation in human skin color and whatnot come from if we're all descended from one family just a couple thousand years ago? What about hermaphroditic or parthenogenic species? How did Noah distinguish between males and females in species that don't have males and females? Were there still two on the ark? And if so, why? How did aquatic animals survive the flood? How did the freshwater fish survive being mixed into the ocean? 
And how did the saltwater fish survive the ocean being diluted with enough rainwater to cover the entire planet? Did Noah bring fish and crabs and sea cucumbers and jellyfish and whales up onto the ark? If so, where did he put them? And if not, why did those animals get to escape God's punishment when things like giraffes and mountain lions and lizards didn't? What did all the carnivores on the boat eat for over a month? If all the fossils that we know to exist were all resurrected at this very second, it would cover the earth in like two feet of solid biomass. Where did all of those animals live before the flood killed them? And what would they have all been eating? And where would all of the carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and all the other elements needed to make all of those things be alive at the same time possibly have come from? And where did it go? If Noah brought every kind of animal onto the ark, why are there any extinct animals at all? Why did things like the dinosaurs have their whole business obliterated while the rest of us got to repopulate? Where are the Gorgonopsids? Where are the Trilobites? Where's Paranthropus? Why don't we find any of them mixed in with the dinosaurs if they died at the same time, and why aren't they around today? What did they do with all the poop on the boat? If the Ark landed on Mount Ararat, then why don't we find any penguin fossils between Turkey and Antarctica? Why don't we find any kangaroo fossils between Turkey and Australia? How did any animals get to the Americas? Why don't we find a ton of every kind of animal fossil radiating out from around that mountain since they would have had to have traveled from there to wherever they are now? And more importantly, how did Noah get them from all around the world to begin with? If all the animals died in the flood and then the earth had to be repopulated with just the animals from the ark, why don't we see a major break in the fossil record while that repopulation happened? Where do diseases come from? Most pathogens are species specific. They can only infect one kind of animal. So wouldn't that mean that every single animal on the ark would have had to have been infected with every single disease that it's possible for that animal to carry in order for those diseases to still be around today? What about all the pathogens that infect plants? What about a lot of things about plants? What about the parasites that have to live in or on other animals to survive? Where did Noah keep the tapeworms? Where did Noah keep the pubic lice? Where did Noah keep the Trichomonas vaginalis? A single-celled protozoan that parasitizes humans, causing the STD known as trichomoniasis. Who did Noah have unprotected sex with in order to make sure that he got it on the ark? Do you see what I mean now? The flood myth not only fails to provide any useful answers, it raises a myriad of unanswerable questions. It is not a productive explanatory tool. And there's a lot of volcanic material mixed into these layers. Vast amounts of molten material entered the ocean. That's what makes up seafloors around the world. That's because of plate tectonics, Jane. It's called seafloor spreading. Consider, for example, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is currently spreading apart at a rate of around 3 centimeters per year. We can do radiometric dating on the Atlantic seafloor farther and farther and farther away from this ridge, and we get measurements of older and older and older rock. Now, why do you suppose we would get different measurements if all of these layers were laid down at the exact same time? It's because they weren't laid down at the same time, Jane. And that relates to the Ice Age. Storm tracking models show that warm oceans would cause severe storms and lead to massive snowfall. Wait, you're saying hotter oceans make colder continents? Sounds weird. It's literally basic climate science, John. It's why pointing to a snowstorm as evidence against climate change is an apocalyptically silly thing to do. Weird, but true. Today's snowstorms begin as ocean water. Hotter water increases evaporation. Plus, volcanic dust and debris would have blocked out the sun during the summer, so the fallen snow would not have melted. Now that makes sense. John, I'm going to need you to stop saying things. If the ocean was deep enough to cover the entire planet, and there was sufficient volcanic activity at the bottom of the brand new worldwide ocean to heat it up and change global climate patterns, then wouldn't that much heat also have affected the formation of all the fossils of all of the animals that just died in this global flood? After all, that's why we don't find any fossils in igneous or metamorphic rock, right? Because that much heat destroys them, right? So if what you're saying made even one fraction of an iota of sense, wouldn't that mean that we would have no fossils whatsoever? You cannot 
just say stuff and expect it to make sense. You have to think about what you are saying. Why do you think volcanoes were part of the flood? It was just 40 days of rain, right? The rain didn't begin until after the fountains of the great deep burst forth, according to Genesis 7:11, meaning that molten material plus water came up through Earth's crust. Most of what comes out of today's volcano is still water as steam. I just went to the kitchen and made myself some quesadillas. I figured I probably wouldn't be missing anything important. Let me know in the comments if they said anything that made any kind of sense. Or if you would also like a quesadilla. Okay, so that explains one ice age. Weren't there like four or five? Well, evolutionists don't have a satisfactory explanation for one ice age, let alone four or five. But the flood gives enough calamity in a short amount of time to actually make an ice age. There was only one that happened a few hundred years after the flood. So just so we're clear, because you don't think that we have sufficient explanations for all of the major ice ages, which we do, by the way, that means that you can ignore most of them and just pick one of them and attribute that one event to something that you have zero evidence for. Sounds about right. For the record, there are lots of different kinds of events that can cause an ice age, but the regularly occurring climate cycles that bring about the glacial periods that we call ice ages are largely and predictably governed by what we call Milankovitch cycles. Milankovitch cycles are variations within three factors of Earth's orbit and orientation, called eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. Eccentricity refers to the shape of the orbit of the Earth. The more oval it is, the more eccentric it is. The more circular it is, the less eccentric it is. The degree of the eccentricity of our orbit varies as the Earth is pulled between the tidal forces of the Sun and the Jovian planets, mainly Jupiter and Saturn. Obliquity refers to the tilt of the Earth's axis. Right now, the Earth is tilted to 23 and a half degrees, which is about halfway between the extremes that the Earth has been tilted to in the past. And finally, precession refers to the direction in which that axial tilt is pointing. The Earth turns this way as well as this way, which is why we get a new North Star every few thousand years or so. Each of these three factors take between tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years to fluctuate, and they each affect the length and severity of both seasons and long-term climate patterns. They are what cause glacial and interglacial periods. They also all comport with both the fossil and the geological record, they are all testable and repeatable, and they all make exponentially more sense than a global flood. The flood gives enough calamity in a short amount of time to actually make an ice age. There was only one that happened a few hundred years after the flood. Which would explain many of the ice age fossils we find near the surface of the earth, not deep down in the flood layers. Like saber toothed cats and woolly mammoths. More recent animals appear higher up in the fossil record because they were alive more recently. I agree with you. I do not, however, agree with you that Mastodon and Gigantopithecus lived together on a boat with a 600-year-old man who was riddled with STDs. Also, the book of Job was written just about that time and mentioned snow, ice, and cold more than any other book in the Bible. The book of Job also mentions behemoth, leviathan, and unicorns. But by all means, go on. Oh, and before anybody flies to the comments to say that I'm misinterpreting those parts, don't forget that Answers in Genesis says that all of those things are literally real because the Bible says they are. So, when scientists try to stretch five extinctions in five different ice ages over the evolutionary view of the geologic column, they're not sure how they happen. But when you compress the geologic column down into a biblical time frame, it's all explained by a worldwide flood followed by an ice age. Yep. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? No, Jane. No, it does not. A conclusion that you arrive at without thinking does not make you think. Overall, I give this video a science teacher challenge level 2 out of 10. This was a seriously weak attempt, even by John and Jane standards. There were several times in this video where they literally just said, science says that, but if you think about it this way, then you'll be thinking about it this way. 
and I don't understand how that would be a compelling argument for anybody. However, they did throw in a couple of arguments that I have seen convince people who simply don't know how we know what we know about the past. So they assume, like John and Jane do, that we're just grasping at straws. So they get a bonus point for that. The truth is, even if we didn't know anything about the Earth's history, a global flood like the one described in the Bible would violate literally everything we know about how this and every other planet works. It would have left behind immense and undeniable evidence, especially if it happened within the biblical time frame of only about 6,000 years. So once again, creationists are insisting that our evidence isn't reliable, but their lack of evidence is. And that simply isn't how science works. Later this month, I'll be releasing this year's Summer Science Road Trip video, so be sure to stay tuned for that and watch it when it comes out. And until then, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye! Bye. <laughs>